The New Testament reading is from James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with, with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human like us, and he prayed fervently and that, it, that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from, wander, from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we talk a lot about God's love for us uh, in church. We also talk a lot about how God is active, a uh, force in the world. Um, one of the first songs I heard about that was, he's got the whole world in his hand. You know, he's got the whole world in his hand. And we certainly talk a lot about prayer in church. You know, how do we do it? When do we do it? Why should we do it? And I just talked with the kids a little bit about that, um, and I hope that was helpful, but today I would like you to really carefully consider the words of the author of James here, and the spirit in which those words were offered. Now, on the surface, this passage is seemingly asking us to consider different reasons why we need to lift people in prayer, perhaps even ourselves. And James even says this, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let me tell you a story. Um, my mother was a woman who had a lot of reasons to feel that her life was out of her control. I've told you about her ministry a couple of times. Well, you can imagine that a woman with a calling to ministry, and that could be a full stop right there. I mean, that's hard sometimes in a language not her own, she had to learn English, in a country she didn't grow up in, um, that kind of put a big target on her back from the get-go. So as an immigrant brought into this country through marriage, she faced initially what was an unfriendly um, but very opportune landscape. So when she arrived, that landscape didn't really value who she was. It instead asked her to contribute to an ideal that we all share as Americans. Sometimes we call it the uh, American dream. You know, we're all sort of born into it if we were born in this country. Some of us inherit it as we move into this country. And yet as time went on, who she was began to make all the difference who she was became important. It transformed the landscape all around her. It fed into her ministry, and it helped people. And this is what God calls us to, siblings in Christ. From the beginning of Scripture in Genesis to the end in Revelation, we are reminded of the power of what a relationship with God can do. Our Creator has, from time immemorial, sought to work wonders through us and make them plain in the world to provide a precious commodity in a world of pain. And that commodity is hope. Now, hope may not seem so precious when we're doing well, but when things are at their bleakest, hope is what makes the difference between giving up and pressing onward. Prayer is a tool that can help us to, to get there. 
Now, it can seem futile, you know, even powerless. We're not really doing much when we're praying. We may be saying words or thinking them, and for the most part, we're still, unless you do it while you're driving, which a lot of us do, or walking, or even running. But it isn't. It is not futile. It is not powerless. What's more, what James appears to be telling us here is that God wants us to pray, which can seem kind of odd considering what God is and what God knows. And I don't think God needs us to ask for help, right? But I do believe God wants an invitation. When we think about creation, and when I look at scriptures and what it says about creation, it seems to me that free will was such an integral part of the equation when God created everything for all of us that I think God yearns to be invited in. Sometimes the invitation can come too late. You know, events that yield the worst outcomes might already have been in motion. And in those moments when we grieve, I believe that God has already been grieving. And then there are these magical times where God is invited in at exactly the right time, when we open the doors of our hearts to the possibility of hope. Some might call these magical times miracles, but the biggest miracle of all is that after generations of faithful or desperate people called out to God for salvation, God responded by putting on flesh and getting down in the mud with us and even died our death. I must confess, I like that idea. I like the idea of calling God down. So often we hear that we need God to raise us up. Not so much calling God down. As if the creator of the universe could be turned by mortal voices and mortal actions. And yet scripture is full of these examples. At a time when God sends a flood to destroy a creation that has turned evil, Noah builds a boat, and humanity lives on through him. When Moses leads Israel from Egypt and they violate God's commandments in the wilderness, Moses intercedes for the nation, and God changes God's mind. The literal words of the text, God changed God's mind. In Jonah, you know Jonah and the whale, God is determined to destroy Nineveh, and Jonah's actions lead all of Nineveh to repent. So God changes God's mind again. I believe there is something about the sincerity of a human heart that God loves. It is the closest that we get to God when we're truthful. When our hearts and our minds are in sync, you know, nothing hidden, nothing held back, our truest selves. We are many of us practiced liars. And yet even those who are responsible for great evil can find forgiveness and transformation when they repent, which is just a way of describing what a, a sincere change of heart looks like. That's all repentance is. Not just transformation for themselves, though, but for the landscape and the people around them. It's consequential. I want to confess to you something. Uh, one of my greatest stumbling blocks uh, that I suffer from uh, are lost causes. Oh, I'm a sucker for lost causes. Uh, you know, I know they exist. I'm aware of them. But when I'm emotionally invested in one, I simply refuse to accept that something might be in fact, a lost cause. I worked as a chaplain at Johns Hopkins Bayview in an intensive program that exposed me to 
what I'll say was a variety of no-win scenarios. The two most challenging were the burn unit, which is, by the way, world class. I did not know that about Bayview before I arrived. And the second would be palliative care, which is the way that we help people who are in great pain or you know, on death's doorstep to uh, feel a little more comfortable. Now, most people in the burn unit have suffered life-altering injuries. One heartbreaking case that I worked on uh, was of a young person who had been dealing with mental health challenges, who had been walking through a park in Baltimore one night and was attacked by a group of youths who doused them in gasoline and lit a match. It was unlikely that this young person would survive. That's what they told me when I arrived on the unit. But the dedication of the doctors and the nurses and the technicians that were caring for this person was amazing. I learned so much about the various techniques and hygiene practices that were necessary to ensure that a patient with severe burns would not succumb to infection or breathing difficulties, which was usually the number one thing, aside from the pain, of course. My role uh, in that situation was not immediately clear to me uh, in my inexperience at the time. I was a pastor. I don't know how to heal people. I don't do medicine, right? I have no degrees. Uh, and I knew that no amount of prayer no matter how fervent on my part, was going to cause God to heal such grievous injuries or ever return this youth to the state that they were in before they arrived to the hospital. That was never going to happen. I didn't know exactly why God put me there, but I knew in my heart that it wasn't for any of that. <laughs> but. I did take note of the way that I was regarded by the staff. So they would take note of my collar. I wore a collar in those days and knew right away whose room I was headed toward. It was always the same room. Now the youth was never awake during my visits. That would not have been appropriate for them. They were in too much pain. And they certainly weren't capable of conversation with me, um, again, due to the nature of their injuries. In fact, I doubt they were ever aware of my presence. What I would do is I would just stand at the foot of the bed and I would pray for like a long time. And I would plead with God to grant mercy, freedom from pain, and rapid healing. I really didn't know what else to pray for other than maybe their family. And I admit once or twice, I wondered if it would be right to pray for their death. It seemed the best option when I allowed myself the briefest moments to look upon their ruined body. No, God didn't put me there to call God down to heal this person. They had a whole medical team to do that. I do wonder if perhaps it was to be a visible sign for others, that God was there, something to take note of and add to their mental calculus. A few nurses became accustomed to my presence, and one day the charge nurse asked if I would be willing to do a short prayer while I was on the unit with anyone who felt like they wanted it um, in their break room. Well, yeah, of course I did. That was like the one thing I felt I could do for them. Um, and I think, honestly, those gatherings did more for me uh, than I was doing for them because units like that can be very isolating. They're very quiet. It's really just about treatment. And it's very quiet at night. You know, the patients are provided with all the pain meds that make sleep possible. Now, you have to consider that when you pray, even when it seems futile, what you're doing may have consequences that reach far beyond the act that you are engaging in at that moment. You may not call God down in the manner 
that you thought was right, but that doesn't mean that God didn't come down. The role of hope in prayer cannot be understated. Hope is a gateway for change. Now, someone who has set their mind on the worst happening does not have hope. They don't hope. They don't allow themselves to hope. They've accepted their fate. They have resigned themselves. They've ruled out the possibility of any involvement from God. They have succumbed to the comfortable, albeit terrible, illusion that things are simply the way they are, and nothing anyone has to say or do about it can change things. But hope is something a person does when they want to leave the door open to the possibility that change can happen. I, I can't imagine that hope is in great supply among the people who have had their lives upended by Helene or who lost loved ones. I can't even imagine what it must be to witness your home leveled by a storm before your very eyes when you had almost no warning as points north of Florida did not. When perhaps only hours earlier, you sat with your family eating something tasty, unconcerned even for just a moment with the troubles of the world. Thankfully, siblings in Christ, hope is not something that we are asked to supply for ourselves 100% of the time. The message of this morning's reading is that we should call upon the faithful around us to help us believe in hope, to believe that God can be called down. Verse 19 may read a little differently when you consider it like that. It said, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, verse 20, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. To help someone find their hope again is doing exactly the same thing as what we've just heard. The mental energy needed to turn from a perspective of hopelessness to one of hope is enormous. I dare say it could power cities. It requires powerful examples of God's action in our, our world to supply that energy. If we're not there, it's not coming from inside. Now, sometimes, some say that that can come from Scripture. You know, you crack open your Bible in a moment of crisis and you read the inspiration that you find there. That's, of course, if you're a person who's receptive to it, particularly in your situation. The Spirit does grant us wisdom when we read our Bible, but in that moment it might not be enough. Sometimes the energy can come from the witness of faithful people who through their words or their actions inspire a hopeless person. Now you will undoubtedly hear people say again and again that wishing people thoughts and prayers is a worthless act. And believe me when I say that, you know, they, they are speaking the truth. They are. It's one thing to wish someone well, which is really what we're doing when we say that. It is entirely another to pray for them as James is teaching us here. No one is made more hopeful in a crisis when they are wished well. But, as the Savior did, for someone to get down in the muck with them and intercede for them with God, that's another matter. That's emotional commitment. Now, in the coming weeks, we will undoubtedly hear more stories of horror coming out of the southeastern states. We will see more stark imagery of towns wiped off the map, or grim findings among the wreckage. I urge you to let those stories affect you. Let them trouble you. Those feelings are there for a reason. 
if only just to motivate us. You have been spared much of the devastation because, hey, you don't live down there. None of us do, you know? We don't have that point of relation. You may know people who do. Does anyone here know people who do? Yeah. And you can be with them in spirit. But you are in a far better position to call God down than they are. You need to let them know that you're trying. We can build hope if we try. So I want to ask you, because, hey, it seems to me uh, the best possible place, really, to do this. I want to invite us to pray for them. Here. Now. If you feel moved to offer up to God prayer, I'd like to ask you to do it in a way that is comfortable to you, but I want to just let you know what's available. So... We consider the altar to be perhaps one of the holiest places in the sanctuary. We have it there for a reason, and there are rails that you might have noticed that we use for communion. Some of us like to kneel when we pray. What better place than before the altar? You can come forward and offer your prayers there. You could stand where you are if you feel like standing, or maybe it's more comfortable to sit and do it that way. Whatever way you think is best, Let's do that. Let's pray to God. I'll allow some time for that to kind of happen, and then I'll move the service along. You know, that's my job. And I'll do my praying after joys and concerns. And you pray for as long as you wish, really. And as Scripture says, may God reckon it to you as righteousness, because you will have acknowledged that there is a Creator and a name under heaven to pray to. Glory be to God, and amen. Please, come forward as you feel led to do so, remain in your seats as you feel led to do so, and we'll take just a moment in prayer.